Welcome, my friends! In this video, we will learn how to convert raw data first into a frequency table, and then into a histogram by hand. At the end, I will briefly discuss how to create an ogive from a frequency table. Simply looking at the raw data for a quantitative variable can be very overwhelming. It's hard to make any astute observations from just looking at raw data. Here we have the exam scores for 250 students in an introductory statistics class. It's difficult to tell what the distribution of exam scores looks like just by looking at the raw data. By distribution, I just mean how frequently different values of our variable occur. There are many ways we could organize this data in order to help us to make sense of what the data is telling us. One such way is to create what is called a frequency table or frequency distribution. Here is what a frequency table looks like for our exam score data. We have split up the data into classes or groups, and counted how many data points fall into each group. For example, there are 16 individuals who scored between a 45 and a 51 on the exam, 21 who scored between 52 and 58, etc, etc. The class midpoint is just the value in the middle of each class, and serves as a single representative number of the values inside the class. The class boundaries are values right between each class. So the first two classes share a boundary of 51.5, the second and third share a boundary of 58.5, etc. Some frequency tables have even more columns than what we are showing here, and it will show you some of the additional columns as we work through an example shortly. The graphical representation of a frequency table is what is called a histogram, and looks something like this. We have graphed the frequencies on the vertical axis and the exam score class boundaries on the horizontal axis. Each class from the frequency table becomes a bar in the histogram. From the histogram, we can easily see that the most common exam score for this data is between 72.5 and 79.5. There are a few different methods of constructing a histogram, and there are subtle differences between each method. I will be showing you how to create a histogram in a form similar to the one shown here from a raw dataset throughout the rest of this video. Here we have a dataset containing the number of children that each of the 45 unique United States presidents had, including adopted children. We would like to organize this data first into a frequency table, and then into a histogram. The first step is to determine how many classes or rows to have in your frequency table. This value will also represent the number of bars in your histogram. Typically, the more data you have, the more classes you should have. There are many ways to determine how many classes to use in a histogram or frequency distribution, and some instructors will simply tell you how many classes to include in any dataset that they give you. One convention that I find easy to use is what is called the 2 to the k rule. This says we should include the number of classes, represented by the letter k, such that 2 to the kth power is greater than the sample size. It's really very simple. Just list out a table with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. as k in your first column, and then 2 to the kth power in your second column. Then start calculating the powers of 2 until you reach a value larger than your sample size. In our case, the sample size is 45, as there are 45 unique presidents. 2 to the first power is just 2, so k equals 1 class obviously is not going to be enough, because 2 is not greater than 45. 2 to the second power is 2 times 2, which is 4, still not larger than 45. Continuing, we get 8, 16, 32, and finally we reach 2 to the sixth power, which is 2 multiplied by itself 6 times, which equals 64. This is the first time that 2 to the kth power is greater than our sample size of 45. This tells us that 6 is an appropriate number of classes for our frequency table and histogram, so that's what we will use. Again, some instructors might simply tell you the number of classes to use, or you might use a different method to determine the appropriate number of classes. Step 2 is to determine the class width. This tells us how many values to include in each class. To find the class width, take the largest value in your data and subtract the smallest value, and then divide by the number of classes determined in step 1. Glancing back at our data, a little bit of searching reveals that the largest value is 16, which occurs twice, and the smallest value is 0. So 16 minus 0 equals 16, and then we divide by 6, which comes to about 2.67 if we round to two decimal places. Now here is an extremely important point. You need to round the number you get from this calculation up to the nearest whole number, 
even if conventional rounding rules would tell you to round the number down. So we round 2.67 up to 3, the nearest whole number larger than 2.67. Note that even if our calculated class width was 2.2, we would still round up to 3. Even if you got a whole number, such as 2, you would still round up to the nearest whole number to get 3. If you don't round up, your classes will not end up containing all of the data. Next, we can move on to our third and final step, which is to actually just create the frequency table. Depending on your instructor, this table could have anywhere from 2 to possibly 8 columns. I'll begin by showing the 5 most common columns of the frequency table, and then show a few more later in this video. First, create a column titled Class Limits, and start with the minimum value in your dataset, which in our case is just 0. Then start adding the class width of 3 until you have the desired number of classes, 6 in our case. So 0 plus 3 is equal to 3, plus 3 again is 6, then we have 9, 12, and 15. These 6 numbers represent the minimum value for each of our 6 classes. Next, determine the upper bound of the first class, which is just one less than the lower bound of the second class. The lower bound of the second class is 3, so the upper bound of the first class must be just one smaller, which is 2. This means our first class will contain the values ranging from 0 to 2. The dash in the middle is really just a dash, and is not a minus sign. Now do the same process we used to find the lower bounds of each class to find the upper bounds. Add the class width over and over until you have covered all of the classes. So we have 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5, plus 3 again is 8, plus 3 is 11, and then 14 and 17. Now you have created your class limits. Note that sometimes due to the rounding of your class width, your last class will end up at a value higher than the maximum point in your dataset. We see that here with 17 as our final upper class limit, which is higher than our largest data point of 16. Now, notice that our class limits have gaps. The upper class limit of the first class is 2, but the next class doesn't begin until 3. The second class ends at 5, but the third class doesn't begin until 6. A histogram plotted this way would include gaps between all the bars, but traditionally, a histogram displays no gaps. There should be no space between the upper value of one class and the lower value of the next class. For that reason, we need to create what are called class boundaries, shared values between adjacent classes. Creating the class boundaries is simple once you have created the class limits. Simply decrease the lower class limits by 0.5 and increase the upper class limits by 0.5. For example, decreasing 0 by 0 0.5 gives us a negative 0 0.5 beginning lower class boundary, and increasing 2 by 0 0.5 gives us a 2.5 beginning upper class boundary. Once you have the first row, you can simply increment by the class width to find the remaining class boundaries, which for us means adding 3 repeatedly. This gives us negative 0 0.5 plus 3, which is 2.5, plus 3 again is 5.5, etc and 2.5 plus 3 is 5.5, plus 3 again is 8.5, etc. If you want to make sure that you've created your class boundaries correctly, you can check to make sure that the upper bound of each class is the same as the lower bound of the next class. So we see that here. The upper bound of the first class is 2.5, and the lower bound of the next class is 2.5 as well, so that's good. For the second class, we see the same thing. We have the upper bound of 5.5, which matches the lower bound of the next class, also 5.5. You should check this for all class boundaries to make sure that you've created them correctly. Next, you will need to count how many values fall into each of your classes, which is frequently done by the use of tallies. Simply look back at your data and determine which class each value falls within. Our first data point is 2, which is within the first class, including the values from 0 to 2, so we make a tally next to the first class. The second data point is 3 which falls in the second class, ranging from 3 to 5, so we place a tally in that class. The third data point is 2, which again falls in the first class, so we put an additional tally in the first class. If you'd like to keep things organized, it might not be a bad idea to cross out the numbers that you have already counted to make sure that you don't lose your place. If we went through our entire data set, our tally mark column should look something like this. Note that every time we reach a multiple of 5, we place a dash through the group of tally marks to make them easier to count later. So in the first class, we have 3 groups of 5 plus 1 additional observation to make 16. 
This is what we record in the next column for frequency. For the 3 to 5 class, we have 3 groups of 5 plus another 2 tallies, which makes 17. We have 9 in the 3rd class, 0 in the 4th class, and 1 and 2 in the last 2 classes. These values represent the number of presidents who had the number of children indicated by the class limits. Finally, we can create the class midpoint, which is simply a single value that represents each class. We can find the midpoint by simply adding the lower class limit and upper class limits together, and then dividing by 2. You will frequently see the lower and upper class limits abbreviated as LCL and UCL, as I have done here in the formula. The midpoint is essentially the arithmetic mean between the lower and upper class limits. For our example, we have 0 plus 2 divided by 2, which is 1, 3 plus 5 divided by 2, which is equal to 4, etc. for all six classes. You might notice that the class midpoints increment by the class width. We have 1, which when we add 3 gives us 4, adding 3 again gives us 7, 10, 13, and 16. Okay, we have finally finished our frequency table. Now we are ready to create the histogram. Each row in the frequency table will become a bar in the histogram, with a height equal to the frequency. Here I have created a histogram from the frequency table. The horizontal axis should be the quantitative variable you have collected data for, in our case the number of children, and the vertical axis should just be the frequency. The labels on the horizontal axis should be the class boundaries. The bars related to adjacent classes should be touching each other to represent the continuous scale of our number system. Now, technically, some instructors might say that you should always start your graph at zero for both the horizontal and vertical axes. But that would create an awkward situation for us in this example, since we have negative 0.5 for our first class boundary. For convenience, I'm starting right at negative 0.5. Otherwise, we would have a bar that would cross over the vertical axis, which would look a little bit sloppy. In some cases, you will see histograms with this symbol, which indicates a changing scale, meaning the axis is skipping over several values until you reach the first observation. Now that we have created the histogram, we can easily tell that most presidents have a fewer number of children, somewhere between 0 and 5, with few presidents having 6 or more children, and very few presidents having 9 or more children. We call a distribution with this shape, with a relatively large number of values towards the bottom or lower end of the distribution, and fewer values towards the top or high end of the distribution, a skewed right distribution. We call this distribution skewed right as the histogram diminishes or tails off as you move from left to right. Let's return to the frequency table again. There is an additional column you might be asked to include, which is titled relative frequency. I have inserted this column next to the frequency column, as its value is based on the frequency, but you could also add this column at the end of the table if you are writing out your solution as you follow along with this video. This column asks us to express the frequency not as a whole number, but rather as a proportion of the total frequency. All you need to do to find the relative frequency is take the class frequency and divide by the total of all frequencies. In our example, the total number of frequencies is 45. When you add up 16, 17, 9, 0, 1, and 2, you get 45. If we take each frequency and divide by 45, we will get the relative frequencies. So we have 16 divided by 45, which is about 0 0.36. 17 divided by 45 is about 0 0.38. 9 divided by 45 is 0 0.2. 0 divided by 45 is just 0. 1 divided by 45 is about 0 0.02 and 2 divided by 45 is about 0 0.04. The total of all relative frequencies should be 1, or very close to 1 if you have rounded your numbers. You could also express these values as percentages, such as 36%, 38%, 20%, etc., by multiplying each relative frequency by 100 and tacking on the percentage symbol. A relative frequency histogram can be constructed from the relative frequency column. The shape of a relative frequency histogram will always be identical to that of a regular frequency histogram as we made earlier. The only difference is that the vertical axis is relative frequency instead of frequency, as you can see here. 
Okay, we are basically done with our discussion of frequency tables and histograms, but there is one more small thing to discuss, just to be complete, which is the construction of what is called an ogive. To create an ogive, we need to add yet another column to our frequency distribution, titled cumulative frequency. This column is very simple to create. For the first class, the cumulative frequency is simply the frequency, which is 16 in our case. For the second class, add up all previous frequencies up until the one you are currently on. So in our case, we simply take 16 plus 17, which is equal to 33. 33 is the total or the cumulative frequency for the class that ranges between 3 and 5. This basically tells you that there are 33 presidents who had 5 or fewer children. We can do the same thing for the remaining classes. The easiest way is to simply take the previous cumulative frequency and add the frequency of the class that you are analyzing. So we take 33, which represents the total frequency for the first two classes, and add on the frequency of the class we are analyzing, which is 9, to get 42. The cumulative frequency of the fourth class is also 42, since the frequency is 0 in this class. Add another 1 to get 43 for the cumulative frequency for the second to last class, and another 2 to get the final cumulative frequency, which is 45. The cumulative frequency for the last class should always equal the total of all the frequencies, which is the same as your sample size. Now we are ready to create an ogive, which is basically a line graph that plots cumulative frequencies. Here is what an ogive would look like for our presidential children example. Just like with a histogram, the quantitative variable is plotted on the horizontal axis, with dashes at the class boundaries, but the vertical axis is now cumulative frequency. We connect the dots which relate to the cumulative frequency of each class. Since we are graphing cumulative frequency, an ogive will always increase as you move from left to right on your graph. Alright my friends, that wraps up our discussion of frequency tables, histograms, and ogives. We will be exploring many more fun and exciting statistical topics that you won't want to miss, so make sure to check out our other videos.